Can everyone begin moving to their seats, please? We'll be starting shortly. Take your seats now, please. Thank you. Would everybody take their seats? There's glasses of water behind me. One right here. I can do that. So, Abby, there's still a bunch of people out there. Just go ahead and get started. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Debbie Cochever, and I'm the Provost and Senior Vice President at Interim here at Tufts University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, we have a, a wonderful evening planned for you. So, um, we have this evening students from around the world, from Tufts, faculty, staff, members of our community, and our very special distinguished keynote speaker, Minister Miroslav Lychek, who will be introduced very shortly. 
So I think many of you don't need the background I'm about to provide, but I, I thought it would be useful to talk just a little bit about um, our Institute for Global Leadership program. I'd also like to thank its director, Dr. Abby Williams, for the inv invitation to join you here tonight. And I want to acknowledge the good work of Professor Diana Chigas. Uh, she's our Senior International Officer and Associate Provost at Tufts. Uh, Diana and her team are responsible for this inaugural run of Global uh, Tufts Week, in which EPIC is a highlight this year. So thanks to Abby and to Diana for their outstanding work at, uh, in internationalism at Tufts. So IGO was created in 1999, and its mission is to prepare new generations of critical thinkers and effective and ethical leaders. These leaders are ready to act as global citizens and to address international and national issues across cultures. The Institute serves as an incubator of innovative ideas to educate learners at all levels and to help them understand and engage difficult and compelling global issues of which we have many. IGL emphasizes rigorous academic preparation and experiential learning, and it does this in a number of ways. Intensive engagement in classes, global research, internships, workshops, simulations, and international symposia, all involving international and national leaders from the public and private sectors, which is an enormous uh, advantage for the students involved in the program. So Tufts has a long history of international engagement, and IGL is a very important part of that. IGL's flag, flagship program, EPIC, Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship, has existed since 1985. It's a highly successful paradigm for integrating academic and experiential learning. Uh, the hallmarks of, these learnings, uh, of this learning is what really every educator strives for, and that is to be interdisciplinary, to connect theory and practice, and to provide students with, with the kinds of priceless interactions that I just mentioned, well outside their normal uh, realm of activity. These interactions are with others from many countries, uh, leading policymakers and practitioners uh, in topics that every year have a, a, uh, a new focus of global importance. So a wonderful part of this experience involves exchange of information and perspectives about the topic among students from around the world. And so this year we are welcoming 66 students from Argentina, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Greece, Israel, Russia, and Singapore as part of this exchange. It's a wonderful list. So Tufts University uh, created a strategic plan about five years ago called T10. And that strategic plan highlights the university's desire to provide students with a transformational experience. EPIC is absolutely a transformational experience, uh, not only for the students that participate in EPIC, but really for the entire Tufts community. Through the symposium, our community learns about the topics of global concern from a variety of perspectives, and hears from the types of important individuals that you will hear from tonight um, in global developments and worldwide debate. So welcome again. Um, I know this will be an engaging evening. I would like to now invite uh, two special students, EPIC students, who, who have the uh, privilege of introducing our speaker tonight. Those students are Rugank Bussari and Connor Doyle, and they will introduce and present the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award to our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Kochiver. It is a great honor to introduce our keynote speaker and recipient of the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award, Minister Miroslav Lajcek, Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. A career diplomat who dreamt of becoming one at the age of 10, Minister Lajcek has worked towards preventing and resolving conflicts, a safer future, and fostering a culture of multilateralism by representing both the Slovak Republic and the international community. He joined the Foreign Service in 1988 and since then has held various positions, including the post of Slovak Ambassador to Japan, Executive Assistant to the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the, ba for the Balkans, 
The Slovak ambassador to the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and Albania. A key figure in the mediation of the post-conflict crises in the Western Balkans, Minister Lajek negotiated, organized, and supervised the referendum on the, on the independence of Montenegro in 2006 on behalf of the European Union. A staunch believer in the potential of the UN, Minister Lajek then served as the president of the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly last year with the aim of achieving results for people and concrete solutions to the world's problems. He advocated for dialogue and strengthening multilateralism. Minister Lajcek is currently in his fourth mandate as Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. From 2012 to 2016, he served as the Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of, Slo of the Slovak Republic. He was reappointed as Foreign Minister in 2016 and 2018, respectively. He is now the chairperson in office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I'd now like to call upon Connor to present the award to Mr. Lajcek. Thank you, Mukank. The Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award was established in 1993 in honor of Dr. Jean Mayer. He was the 10th president and first chancellor of Tufts University, serving from 1976 to 1993, in addition to being a global humanitarian. Past recipients include illustrious scholars and practitioners whose moral courage, personal integrity, and passion for scholarship resonated Mayer's dictum that scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. It is a great honor to present this award to His Excellency Miroslav Lajcek, our keynote speaker this evening. I'd first like to thank the minister for taking the time to be here with us. Um, minister Lajcek has dedicated his life's work to diplomacy and is a staunch advocate for multilateralism as emphasized by his work at the United Nations. Serving as the president of the 72nd UN General Assembly, Minister Lajcek spearheaded the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration abbreviated the GCM, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on the 19th of December, 2018. The compact was the first intergovernmental document prepared under the auspices of the United Nations to cover the multifaceted dimensions of migration in a holistic manner. The compact stressed a comprehensive approach to addressing migration, including protecting the dignity of migrants, supporting countries rescuing and hosting large numbers of refugees and migrants, combating xenophobia, and encouraging the integration of migrant groups. For his service in international diplomacy and his work on the Global Compact for Migration, it is my honor and privilege to present the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award to Minister Miroslav Lajcek. The citation for the award is as follows. In recognition of your distinguished diplomatic career and inspirational leadership in improving global cooperation on migration. Good evening, Professor Williams, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was not sure, and I'm, I was almost sure that uh, there will be no audience because it's Friday night. Uh, and I had it checked like three times, and, <laughs> and Professor Williams confirmed that you will be here, so I'm very pleased to see you. Uh, thank you very much for the award. I'm really moved uh, that you've decided to present it to me. Although it's a bit risky to present it before I've delivered my lecture. <laughs> you could have still kept your options open, depending on whether you liked it or not. But now I'm motivated not to disappoint you. And I want to commend you for choosing the topic of migration as a key theme for your symposium. 
because it's really a very urgent, very contemporary, very political, very complex issue, and I really hope that you've already learned a lot about, the, about this phenomenon. I've seen the program, so you have been already discussing and, uh, this, this topic from different perspectives. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a professor, I'm not going to, to bring new data or trends. Uh, I'm a policy practitioner, and uh, I'm here to share my first hand experience with uh, migration with you, and especially the one that I've earned during my uh, year at the helm of the United Nations General Assembly, because it was during my mandate when the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration was agreed. And uh, I also have the experience with migration as a foreign minister of the member state of the European Union, because for us, the issue of migration has been at the top or very close to the top of foreign policy priorities for almost five years now. But uh, if you are interested in that, I can answer your questions, but uh, I want to focus my lecture on, on the UN experience and the preparation of the Global Compact. Why? Because the, the theme of my presentation sounds need for better managing international migration. And uh, the, the process to adopt, I mean, to, to agree on and to adopt the Global Compact, which is the most complex, most comprehensive, and most inclusive uh, document addressing migration, was an effort to do exactly that. And in addressing the topic, I would like to answer four questions. First, why and how the Global Compact was born. Second, where did the things go wrong and why. Third, which lessons can be learned for future. And finally, what's the possible way forward. So let's start with uh, why the whole process began. Migration is an old phenomenon, probably as old as the humankind itself, but uh, it somehow came to the prominence uh, with the migration crisis in Europe in 2015. Uh, let me remind you that uh, that year more than one million migrants arrived uh, to Europe and the Europe was unable to cope with, with this phenomena, with this huge number of people, basically failed to address the issue. And one thing that uh, w became clear that year was that we cannot continue dealing with migration in a way that it is a business as usual. We cannot uh, have an ad hoc approaches, ad hoc mechanisms, because this is not an ad hoc phenomenon. And we cannot uh, try to address this global phenomenon without having a global solution. So that's why the member states of the United Nations came together in September 2016 and adopted what's called New York Declaration, where for the first time recognize that uh, migration is a global phenomenon and should be addressed as such. And the, the global declaration tasked the General Assembly to prepare and agree on a document which is called Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration and to have it agreed and adopted in 2018. It, it was the first ever effort to have a comprehensive document addressing migration from a global uh, scale because uh, we had some partial uh, documents addressing like uh, migrants, labor rights or other issues but nothing like uh, a global and comprehensive document. So uh, we say that a Global Compact takes 360 degree approach. That means addressing all aspects of migration. And uh, this, is the, this was the mandate that I received when I arrived as the president of the UN General Assembly in uh, September 2017. The process uh, consisted of, of three parts. The, the first part was consultations. It took place between April and November 2017. It was an extremely inclusive process with the participation of governments, but also private sector, NGOs. And during the, this process, uh, st stories were bro brought to the table and of, uh, lots of data was generated. The process was taking place in New York and in Geneva because these are both hubs for migration and expertise. And let me mention some of the these facts. 
First of all, less than 5% of the world's population is moving across borders. That means 95% of the global migration is happening within countries. Average age of an international migrant is 39, uh, yes, 39 years. Migrants are moving in all directions, south, south, north, 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 south, south, north. But the highest portion of international migration takes place between developing countries. 34.8% of migrants are moving between developing countries. Migrants account for 3.4% of global population, and they contributed 9.4% to global GDP in 2017. So these are some of the data that are always helpful to know when you are trying to address an issue. The second stage of the process was called stock taking, and it took place in December 2017 in Mexico, Puerto Vallarta. And basically, we went there for a retreat to digest everything that we heard, we learned, uh, to, to be able to move to the next stage. And it was exactly on the eve of this uh, retreat in Puerto Vallarta when we received the news that the United States decided to pull out of the process. Because the New York Declaration was uh, adopted by all 193 member states of the United Nations, but then the US government announced that they are not coming to Puerto Vallarta and will not participate in the process. It was a big blow, obviously. Uh, no compact is global if the US is not part of it. At the same time, there was a very strong commitment to continue the process with the same level of determination, and we, and we did, and we continued. And then the third phase of the process was actually the intergovernmental negotiations that took place between February and July last year. So at the beginning, the zero draft of the document was uh, presented, which was the bones, I would say the skeleton of the future document, and we had six rounds of negotiations. Very difficult, very painstaking, very detailed, line by line, word by word, not easy at all. We had some very tough moments, but in the end, on 13th of July last year, we were able to agree on the text. It was a very emotional moment, I have, I have to tell you. After 18 months of a most comprehensive exercise, there was a text which was agreed by 192 countries of this world. When I was addressing the General Assembly on that occasion, I expressed my cautious optimism, and I tried to say what this document is and what it is not. And I said that the agreement addresses this, the fact that migration is a reality, and it also offers a, a way how to deal with it. It does not encourage migration, nor does it aim to stop it. It is not legally binding, it does not dictate, it will, not impose anything, and it fully respects the sovereignty of states. And its potential is huge, because it can guide us from a reactive to a proactive mode. And it can help us to enhance, multiply the benefits of migration and mitigate the risks and downsides of it. And it can be a resource in finding the right balance between the rights of people and the sovereignty of states. At the same time, I warned the member states that the work was not over because agreement is not yet the adoption. And I asked everyone to stay on track until the document is adopted. And the adoption was scheduled for December last year in Marrakesh, Morocco. And as a matter of fact, uh, I was back then already a bit nervous about the, this span of six months between the agreement and the adoption, because uh, knowing the sensitivity of the issue, it could not be taken for granted that, uh, that nothing bad will happen to the document. And unfortunately, this is exactly what happened. And the fact is that original idea was to have the document adopted in September in New York, but then the government of Morocco came with a, with a noble idea to organize a special event, to host this special event, and to, to give a greater prominence to the, to the adoption of this document. But Things as it usually happens, or sometimes happens in life, did not go according to the plan. Why? And that's my second point. What went wrong? So as I said, the United States pulled out uh, of the process in December, but then we had the 192 countries staying as part of the process throughout until the agreement on the text. 
but when the, the document was put on vote in the General Assembly in December, we only had 164 countries endorsing it out of 193. And I'm very sorry that uh, my own country, Slovakia, did not join uh, the, the support and did not vote for this document, which uh, uh, well, prompted me to submit my resignation as a, as a foreign minister, but that's a separate story. The question why, why we could not keep the unity of the 192. First, because uh, unfortunately, the story was moved away from facts. I mean, migration itself is a fact. It cannot be denied. Whether we like it or not, migration is a reality. It is a fact. It's not an idea. It's not a theory. It's not a trend. It is a fact. But unfortunately, the discussion about this document moved very far away from facts. Even though it was said very clearly that it's not a legally binding document, we, were, we heard from many politicians that this document is going to impose migration policies on governments against their sovereign will, even though we made it very clear that uh, the, the purpose of this document is not to encourage illegal migration. This is exactly what we heard, again, from the politicians. And there was, uh, unfortunately, an atmosphere, particularly in Europe, that did not make possible a uh, reasonable fact-based uh, discussion. And we had the snowball effect, one government after another jumping on the bandwagon of those who were pulling out of the process. And uh, honestly, if uh, the, the, the ceremony was to be take place in uh, February, not in December, I think we would have even more uh, countries dropping out of the process. And uh, those who were providing the false information about the, about the document were so loud that nobody even had the chance to ask them what's the alternative, because they offered no alternative. But of course, it would be too easy to blame the politicians, because uh, the problem has deeper roots, namely the deficit of trust between politicians and people these politicians represent. Unfortunately. We, this is the phenomenon we have been observing lately in many countries of the world. People want leaders who listen to them. People want leaders who speak their language and who are able to address and solve their problems. Unfortunately, over the years, politicians somehow got more and more detached from the problems of people, very much locked in their own bubbles, speaking about procedures, about bureaucratic processes, uh, about issues that people don't see as their own. And this is exactly the environment when the other voices are so appealing. And of course, this is, this, does not, uh, is the, this is not only the case with migration, but with many other issues. Speaking about Europe and European Union, uh, a huge mistake was made by European institutions by proposing to address the issue of migration uh, through distribution of migrants uh, through quotas, compulsory quotas, which was a very bureaucratic approach to an issue which is all but bureaucratic. It's a political, social, economic, humanitarian issue, but certainly not a bureaucratic issue. And uh, as a result, this uh, effort to impose distribution through quotas created fear and very irrational atmosphere in Europe, which is also partly responsible for the fact that so many European countries pulled out of this process. So I would say that in, in this climate, the Global Compact on Migration became the scapegoat of a wider problem. However, I'm still convinced that the Global Compact was and is a success. We had the most comprehensive negotiations on migration in history. We had the most comprehensive agreement on migration in history. Now, what are the lessons learned? Lesson number one, migration is complex. Migration brings benefits, such as boost host economies, enrich cultures, build resilience. But it also brings pitfalls, such as brain drains, labor surplus, or the strain on social services. And there is no objective assessment of migration, because every person has a different experience uh, with it, and therefore every person has a different position on migration. 
And in this situation, it's so important to build or to base our discussions on migration on facts and hard data. And uh, here, the role of academic institutions such as yours is crucial to help us politicians to, to build our discussions on facts and on truth. Lesson number two, there can be no such thing as national response to migration. Because by definition, migration is an international phenomenon and therefore require, it requires international cooperation. No single country can address the issue of migration alone. And, also, and this also goes for countries itself. So we need trust building and we need cooperation between countries at the international, regional, national level, but also within countries, between the governments, service providers, such as health services, for example, but also civil society, uh, think tanks, and so on. That's the only way how we can address this complex phenomenon. And the lesson number three is that diplomacy works and the multilateral di di diplomacy is powerful because the process of agreeing on the document on the global compact was a fascinating experience to see diplomacy in action, in working. And as I said, there were many difficult moments, but in the end there was one commitment to deliver and to be able to offer a global solution or global answer to a global Phenomena, and this was exactly where I wanted, always wanted to see the UN General Assembly as the most representative global forum. is an ideal platform to address the global phenomena such as migration. Multilateralism simply holds the key to all the challenges we are facing today, not only the migration, but also issues such as climate change, terrorism, organized crime. We only can tackle them uh, with with a multilateral cooperation. And my last point, looking ahead to the future, what do we see? Firstly, we see hope for the global compact, because the fact is that the document does not make headlines anymore, which is good, but it is still there, and now we are in the phase of implementation. We are working on that, and I am certain that we will see positive results, and they will speak for themselves. And uh, I really believe the momentum is still going, and uh, in a couple of months, people will see that this document is actually an instrument to help. Second, the root causes. By now, the situation in Europe has improved. L last year, we have seen the lowest number of arrivals in five years. We have a number of projects, development projects, humanitarian projects, trying to deal with the issue that are put in action and they are delivering, but we cannot be complacent because the root causes have not disappeared. There are still so many conflicts around the world that are generating migrants. The climate change, we are still struggling to address it, and it is a phenomenon that is forcing people to leave their houses. Inequality, that generates poverty, despair, and again migration. So we must not believe that we found all the answers to the question. It's rather tactical truth and not a uh, the st strategic victory. And my third point is called dialogue and solidarity. If we want to address all these phenomena, we need to engage in an honest and genuine dialogue. Not to talk at each other, but to each other, and to listen to each other, and to understand that we have a common responsibility, uh, and we should act in solidarity. Because, uh, again, speaking about Europe, obviously the frontline countries are Greece, Italy, Spain, but migration is not Greek, Italian, or Spanish problem. It is a European problem, and therefore Europe as, as a whole should be able to address it. But not in a way of one size fits all. Not through administrative bureaucratic solutions. We need a tailored approach. We need everyone on board, but everyone contributing the best way that suits the country, its size, its history, its geographical location. And of course, Institutions must be able to come up with solutions that are workable, that can be implemented on the ground. And people need to see action. People need to see vision. People need to see results. And this is the only way how we can succeed. So uh, if there is one message I want to leave you with, it is this one. I believe multilateralism is our only way forward.
looking back through history, we can see that every time humankind almost destroyed our civilization, we turned to multilateralism as a solution to prevent us from committing the, the same mistakes again. And we, as I said, have many challenges ahead. Irregular migration is one of them, but there are many others, nuclear threat, terrorism, violent extremism, climate change, as I said. There is no way we can close our eyes. We can, there is no way we can deal with these issues in our national capacities. And of, of, of course, it would be highly irresponsible to ask the others to do it for us. We can only do it together. So as you are students and future leaders, I really wish you to remember that if we want to succeed, we have to work together. Thank you very much for your attention. Q&A now, so if we could form a single file line behind that one microphone. All right, this is good now. Um, try and keep your questions short, as the minister has a plane to catch. I'll be needing to cut this off at 7.30. Hi, uh, hi. so my name is Charles Borgio. I'm a sophomore here at Tufts University. And first of all, thank you so much for being here with us today and share your experiences in um, making this historical document. I'm very, very, very lucky to be able to uh, have a discussion and reading on the document as part of this year's EPIC program. Uh, so I want to address on some of the uh, criticism of the, of the compact. So just uh, after the compact is signed, there's uh, criticism that um, it is very broad and very too idealistic to be achieved. So how do you respond to this kind of criticism? And how can the United Nations or other internal organizations push for national governments to fulfill their promises on the ground? Thank you. As I said, this is the first document of its kind, and it, was, it is as ambitious as 192 member states were able to agree. It was uh, made very clear from the beginning that it will not be a legally binding document. It is rather a set of recommendations, and it is for member states uh, to implement them. But it's also, you know, an, like a list of, of uh, possible uh, actions to be taken, and it is for each government to decide which ones are applicable for them. And when people are saying that this is not a legally binding document and therefore it will not change anything, I always say, look at the Sustainable Development Goals. They are legally non-binding either. And yet, they are changing the way we are treating our planet. And the implementation of the Global Compact is based on the same philosophy, namely that the member states will come to the General Assembly to inform about the measures they are taking to implement this document and they will be learning from each other. So it's all about the political will, but I do believe and I'm certain that this document provides a very good platform. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Viktor Olutenko. I'm uh, coming from the Harvard Kennedy School. And um, I'm originally from Moldova, and my government worked with you and your ministry a lot on European integration and on migration policy. Thank you so much. I'm just coming from um, another event at the Fletcher School on political risk, and I've asked the panel there, what is the opinion uh, about if Europe is ready for another migration crisis, and if Europe is managing, uh, is prepared um, for, for the future migration crisis? And um, the, the answer was no. And what Europe is doing now is just throwing money at countries around its borders. And this is definitely not sustainable. That's what I've got from people working in political risk, advising big investments coming into Europe and around the, the world. What's your take on this? What did Europe learn from the migration crisis? And is Europe ready for the next one? Thank you. I disagree with no. I would say not fully. Uh, a lot has changed, especially the mentality and, and the way Europe sees migration. It is clear to everyone now that migration needs to be regulated and that we need to curb the uh, illegal migration and, of course, to 
to support the regular migration. We, it has been already understood in Europe that we need to protect our external border, European border, Schengen border in particular. We need to review uh, the, the Dublin system of, uh, provi of providing asylum. We are still struggling to agree ex on exact para parameters, but no one is questioning that. We have already invested in countries, in the frontline countries outside of Europe, such as Turkey, for example, Mor Morocco and others. So that, uh, and we have taken a number of concrete steps to, well, to limit, to, to, to mem minimum uh, the number of illegal migrants arriving. So uh, I just don't uh, see the situation similar to the one in 2015 happening. But can I say that we have the system fully in place? No, not yet. But at least we are not fighting over what is the right approach. There is a clear understanding what the right approach is. Thank you. So good evening, Minister. Thank you for coming here. My name is Julia, and I'm from Russia. And my question also relates to Europe and to the European Union in particular. Uh, like, it's, there must have been several differences to reconcile while the negotiations were underway between European countries, the members of the Union. And my question is, does uh, the European Union act rather as a united um, body, as a single actor, or the differences are just too strong and countries are rather separated on the issue, and how it uh, helps or doesn't help uh, to finally real, uh, well, bring the agreement like, on. Thank you. You know, I'm an EU positive person, so uh, my answer would be positive for the European Union. Uh, EU is a family of 28 members, and obviously 28 members do not always automatically agree on everything right from the beginning. So there are discussions, but uh, the most important thing about Europe is that we listen to each other and we try to find a solution that everyone out of 28 can sign up to. So that's why it takes time. But uh, as I said uh, in my previous answer, there is a clear understanding, which was not there in 2015. And uh, Europe is ready to in invest what it takes uh, to make sure that we will preserve the lifestyle of European citizens uh, preserve our values and the principles on which the European Union is built, and I really believe that we will succeed. Of course, this year is a political year for Europe. We will have elections for European Parliament, formation of new institutions, so it will have an impact, uh, but at the same time, uh, as I said, I'm rather positive and, and the solution will be found. And it will be a European solution that me means it's not hostile to the rest of the world. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Lajcek. Um, I'm Arjun, and I'm part of the EPIC class. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the award, and thank you so much for your inspiring speech. Um, in your thank speech, you. you underscored the importance of a multilateral solution over a unilateral one. Um, but previously, multilateral solutions have led to extended delays due to bureaucracy and misunderstanding between countries. So how do you believe that in the case of migration, a, a multilateral solution would overcome the problems of bureaucracy and delays? Look, multilateral systems give us a system of uh, rules, norms uh, that should be respected by everyone. And this is the key. If we don't have, what is the alternative to multilateral system? Either no rules at all, that means uh, anarchy, or the rules imposed by the more powerful ones over the, the, the less powerful ones, which is not a more attractive option. Right now we do see, unfortunately, an erosion of multilateralism an erosion of a respect for the rules, and that's why the world looks the way it does. So the only way forward is to agree on the rules, and it also means that the rules must not be imposed, they really must be agreed on everyone. And nowadays, 21st century brings us challenges that which are global in the nature, and therefore they require global responses. I mean, there is no way single country can address climate change. There is no way single country can address Terrorism. There is no way a single country can address migration. So therefore, we need a global multilateral model which is based on the rules. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Lyshak. My name is Uzair. I'm also from the EPIC class. My question was about the UN's PR machine. Um, as you stated, the Global Compact of Migration was a specific type of document, and it wasn't a specific type, type of document, and that message had to be conveyed not only to members of the UN, but to the public as well. 
Um, as you said in your speech, that failed um, in certain countries. And so what lessons can be learned and how can the UN's PR machine be improved to ensure that other global compacts don't suffer the same fate of domestic polit like politicization of events um, and, and we can move forward to having a truly global compact or a truly global agreement in, in other issues that we will face in the future? Well, the, the way it works, it should work, and the only way how it can work is that uh, UN comes with the agenda, uh, but then the member states implement the agenda. U UN comes with messages, but then the member states implement the messages and multiply the messages. There is no such thing as the UN convincing the governments or delivering the, uh, the work on behalf of, of national governments. So all the governments are part of the, the UN processes. They are sitting at the table there, so it is expected from them to, to come back home and to promote, to defend, and to implement. What happened with the compact in several countries is that the delegations who were part of the process until the very end, who were making their proposals and the proposals were accepted, who were part of the adoption of the, of the document, all of a sudden, for completely different reasons unrelated to this document, decided to pull out using false arguments. And there is nothing United Nations can do about it. So therefore, UN can be only as uh, strong, as successful, and as, as efficient as the member states want it to be and allow it to be. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Sebastian Loretti. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. I'm sure we all uh, very much appreciate it. And uh, my question relates to Europe and really Europe's uh, strategic future. Uh, we've seen in recent years, not just under the Trump administration, but kind of under the Obama administration, the United States has begun to trend towards a more isolationist, less involved uh, role in the world. And uh, my question is, how does that uh, affect, what does that mean for Europe's like, long-term uh, strategic position? Is Europe going to have to uh, begin acting like uh, uh, more like a great power and begin uh, more efficiently deploying the $20 trillion or so worth of economic resources it has uh, to achieve uh, objectives like you know, um, stabilizing the Middle East through foreign aid, or you know, if necessary, maybe through military intervention so you don't have to deal with the refugees. Because as we saw in Syria, the traditional US policy would have been to intervene, to contain the civil war before it spread and went on for years. But when the United States didn't, Europe didn't have the, the will or the capability uh, to do it themselves. So do you think Europe needs to begin to integrate more and begin to act like a continent? Uh, and yeah, so like, what's Europe's future in that? This is a very important question and very much on the agenda of European uh, diplomats and European institutions because, you know, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, once said, uh, and I quoted him several times, that he said, I'm always pleased to hear Europe speaking with one voice, provided it's not the voice of Washington. <laughs> and there is something about it because the fact is that for 70 years, uh, Europe was living a very convenient life following the US lead and almost lost the ability to define its own interests because they were, for most of this time, similar to the interests of, of the United States. We have no doubt that the transatlantic relationship between Europe and the US is the most natural, uh, most powerful, and most productive, I would say, uh, partnership for this planet. And it has delivered extremely positive results. What is happening now is, uh, first of all, that not everything that comes from Washington uh, corresponds to the values and principles on which the European Union uh, was built. Uh, and uh, Europe is a bit confused because now the partnerships and the principles are not automatically in the same place. Yeah. Secondly, President Trump, uh, Secretary Pompeo made it very clear uh, that they do, not, do no longer consider multilateralism to be the best answer to, to today's world's challenges. Yeah while Europe believes the op in, the, in the opposite, and so do I. So Europe has to come to terms with, with this. I personally believe that there is nothing wrong for Europe to become more emancipated, as I call it, more mature, more aware of its own interest, and, and more able to stand up, not against 
the US, but for the principles. And I think everyone will benefit from it. Okay. The worst outcome of this current situation for the European Union would be a deep division. For those who are, let's put it uh, in, a, in a simplistic way, those who, no matter what the situation, follow the US lead, and those who stick to the principles, and if the lead goes in different direction, would, would refuse to follow it. I hope it will not happen. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the partnership is very strong, deeply rooted, but you asked the, exactly uh, the right question. These are the dilemmas of the European Union these days. And if, and if, if I may, sir, um, sure. I, also, um, it's, you, uh, in, in the years to come, we've seen uh, China's rise and the way it's looking, it seems the United States is gonna treat China as a main competitor which also means the Indo-Pacific region is going to be a priority. we move on to the, the next question? No, 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 no let, let him finish. Yeah, if I may, yeah, so basically, Europe's no longer number one, and the Indo-Pacific is becoming number one, and Europe's becoming number two. So is Europe expecting that they're going to have to take on a much larger burden than historically they have when the United States thought of Europe as its main center? Look, this uh, is, a, center? first of all, Europe is still the largest free market in the world. Yeah. And second, uh, this is one more reason for Europe to establish itself because the fact is that we are now living the times of transition from a unipolar to multipolar world and for me it would be beneficial for this planet if the European Union establishes itself as one of the polar poles of this world because uh, of all European Union stands for but no one will do it for us so we have to do it. Thank you very much. Time for one more short question. I Let, th let's, do two, let's do both because oh. it's not fair. To yeah. All right. I'll, I'll try keeping it short. Uh, thank you for being here again. Uh, I'm a student from Tufts University. I'm Ishmael. I'm just here. just want to watch. But um, when, you, when you mentioned all those things about the document failing and all that, you know, I, I, like, the document made sense, and most of us here would agree that there, there are good ideas there, but it failed, right, anyway. And... It makes me question, you know, the, the idea of, like, statesmen versus politicians. And I'm sure you, in your, during your time, you had to deal with that. And my question is, how do you get around politicians? Um, you know, statesmen, you're a statesman. You care about the state, you care about the future and all that. But some people in government may, ne may not necessarily have that same belief. So how do you deal with that? You know, the statesman... Is the, <coughs> is the one who thinks about the future generation and the politician is the one who thinks about the future elections. That, that's what makes the di difference. And I would not say the document failed. The document was adopted by 85% of the world's population and the member states. Uh, it is this 15% who failed. Mm -hmm. And this document is the best we have. And no one has ever proposed anything else. Ignoring, asking the others to take care, these are not the solutions. And as I said, there is a follow-up mechanism in place already happening. So I really believe that after the dust has settled, and this is happening now, the countries will quietly come back to the negotiating table because they will understand that it's better for them. If you exclude yourself from the global discussions on the global phenomena, you are hurting yourself. You are not helping yourself. So, but some countries, unfortunately, my own as well, will need some time to understand that. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Guillaume Payou, and I'm a French sophomore student from Tufts University. Uh, I wanted to just ask you um, to expand on something you just uh, answered earlier regarding uh, Europe having uh, found this willingness to, um, to regulate migration. While I do agree that there has been this willingness, do you believe that Europe has found a way how to do it? Because I feel like that's a, that's a much greater issue for the continent, and as we've seen with very different governments in Italy, very different governments in Eastern Europe, there's very different ways to do it. Uh, you are right, but nonetheless, there is a set of uh, steps that uh, we have agreed to implement. And there is a full understanding. As I said, uh, better information sharing, uh, avoiding the fact that the person can ask for asylum in several EU member states without them knowing about it, or m moving, f being denied in one country, moving to the another country, and, and doing the going through the same procedure. Better protection of the external border. Better, more efficient policy of returns. Uh, of course, better assistance of the frontline countries through which the, the bulk of migrants is arriving in Europe. Modernization of the asylum uh, policy in the European Union. 
So the principles are there, and there is a full understanding. But devil, as always, is in the details, so the discussion now is about how to deliver on some of these principles, particularly the, the asylum mechanism, the Dub Dublin mechanism. But uh, there is no escape. So we really have to find, so if we want to preserve Europe as it is, if we want to preserve one of the four freedoms, name, namely the freedom of movement, if we want to preserve Schengen, which is one of the greatest achievements of European project, uh, we have to find solutions, and everybody understands that. Thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, Antoine from France. Uh, you, you, you told us that uh, the document and the European policy uh, already have uh, good impacts because the figures of the migrants from uh, arriving in Europe are decreasing. Just a reminder, um, if the figures are decreasing, it's just because the EU uh, give, uh, gives money to uh, countries such as Sudan, um, Chad or Turkey, which are dictatorship uh, countries, uh, to uh, close the border uh, directly in uh, Africa or the Middle East. Uh, that is that uh, the EU is externalizing his, uh, uh, its border directly in, uh, in uh, Africa or the Middle East. Uh, I said that because they steal, the, the EU steals the money of the development budget. To, uh, that, that's not an investment. They're just giving money to a dictator or, or authoritarian regime uh, to control the borders directly on, the, on this continent. So if I, tol if I tell you that I consider the EU policy as a criminal policy, what do you think about that? I disagree. <laughs> I disagree because uh, what Europe is doing is uh, trying to address the problem where the problem is born. Of course, if the bulk of the migrants are arriving uh, from African countries, Europe is trying to invest, not to bribe uh, the authorities, but to invest in the future for the, for, for, for the young generation of these countries to invest in better system of education, better system of healthcare. If you don't see a future for yourself in, in your country, nothing will stop you and you will, you will leave. But Africa will have two billion inhabitants in 2050. So if we don't address the problems where they are born, then there is, you know, there is no prevention. So, and this is what Europe is trying to do. Obviously, these are not the measures that will deliver concrete results within a week or a month. So, but we have to be very consistent, we have to be very systemic. And, and uh, this is the only right policy we can do. And obviously it would help a lot if we manage finally to stop the conflicts, uh, because the conflicts generate a huge number of, uh, of migrants, of refugees. So we cannot see these two uh, phenomena in, in separation, because they are closely linked. I disagree, but thank you for your answer. You have your right to disagree, but I'm right. <laughs> Thank you for an insightful and engaging keynote. Uh, we'll be moving on. Thank you, Foreign Minister. Thank you very much. <laughs>